Hello, and thank you everyone for attending today's Zoom webinar. This is part one of the two-part lecture series, Supporting LGBTQ Plus Youth in the Don't Say Gay or Trans Era, which is also being co-sponsored by the Bard Queer Leadership Project at Simons Rock. Um, if you've attended one of the previous alt-liberal arts events, then welcome back. Um, but if this is your first, then Alt Liberal Arts is a nonprofit education initiative partnered with the Open Society University Network, Bard College, and Pen America that provides virtual alternatives to fill the gaps created by censorious legislation that is impacting what can be taught in our classrooms. Uh, my name is Sophia Brown. I am a community outreach coordinator working with Pen America to support free expression initiatives in Florida's public colleges and universities. Um, I am also a recent graduate of the New College of Florida, and most importantly, I was up until very recently a queer student in Florida's public education system. And as a queer student, I've experienced the benefits that come with an open and accepting educational environment. Um, but my peers and I have also seen the recent trend of legislation across the U.S., uh, many of which ban the inclusion of LGBTQ plus issues in school curricula and bar transgender students from school activities and facilities. And to me and my peers, this legislation spreads the message that our identities are inappropriate uh, and they don't belong in schools. And this this legal landscape and the effects that this has on LGBTQ plus youth is what we are here to talk about today. And luckily, we have a very excellent scholar to lead us through this conversation. Uh, Michael Sadowski is the Associate Dean of Bard College. His 2016 book, Safe is Not Enough, has been cited by Kevin Jennings, who is the founder of the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, as the most important book written on LGBTQ issues in education in his lifetime. Uh, his 2021 memoir, Men I've Never Been, was named one of the 30 best gay and lesbian books of all time by Book Authority and was shortlisted for the William Faulkner William Wisdom Award for nonfiction. In the early 2000s, he also won a National Press Club Award for his reporting in the Harvard Education Letter and has previously taught at Harvard and Stanford universities. Alt Liberal Arts is very excited to have partnered with Michael Sadowski to bring you today's lecture, which will also have a second part next Monday on the 13th, and will include a panel of several other scholars and activists focused on LGBTQ plus issues to discuss the ways that educators and communities can support LGBTQ plus youth in spite of this increasingly hostile environment. Um, so we're about to get started, but real quick, chat has been disabled for our viewers, but we do have a lovely Q&A option. So we encourage you to submit questions or comments throughout the presentation, and we've saved some time at the end to, to answer them. Um, so with all of that in mind, uh, Michael, I think I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sophia, for that excellent um, and very thoughtful introduction. I really appreciate it. So hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I hope everyone can see that. Um, so yeah, so Sophia said, um, this is part one of a two-part series called Supporting LGBTQ Plus Youth in the Don't Say Gay or Trans Era. So this first part, I'm going to be talking about the research and legal landscape of these issues, mostly nationally. So Sophia did a great job introducing me, so I won't, um, I won't say much more than that. Um, she even mentioned my book, Safe is Not Enough, um, which I wanted to share with you. And um, a lot of the research that um, I'm going to be presenting here um, was the, the kind of work I was doing in preparation for that book. And she also mentioned my memoir, so I don't need to tell you about that. Um, but I'd like us to start by ask, actually asking everybody to use um, the Q&A function and think about how you would complete this sentence, and maybe put a few key words in that Q&A, if you would. Um, and not necessarily even thinking about the theme of today's session, but just how would you complete this sentence? I believe all students deserve to feel blank at school. Let's 
give you about a minute to think about that. Maybe put some words in the Q&A. And I will, they should be visible to you. Um, so I'm seeing welcome, accepted, free to learn, empowered, welcomed and supported, safe, welcome, safe, belonging, valued, affirmed, accepted, valued, welcome, fully actualized. Nice. Thank you. So we're just going to put those words aside for a minute. And um, I'm going to share some data with you. And this is from the 2021 National School Climate Survey by Glisson, which is the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. And in case you're not familiar with it, Glisson is probably the largest and most important organization in the country advocating for the needs of LGBTQ plus students and LGBTQ plus inclusive programming in uh, pre-K to 12 schools in the United States. So they do this um, National School Climate Survey um, every two years, and they've done it since the 1990s. And just to give you an idea of what their sample looks like, these are the self-identified sexual orientations of uh, the students who completed the sample, who numbered more than 22,000. Um, so as you can see, most of the students um, identify somewhere under the LGBTQIA plus umbrella. Um, and they have a variety of, of self-identifiers. Um, this survey is... Um, distributed to students through social media, through um, LGBTQ plus uh, youth groups, both in schools and in communities. So its purpose is to reach an LGBTQ plus audience. And that's what they tend to get um, in the sample. Um, the gender or gender identity of the Glisten sample, um, about 34% identified as cisgender, 27% identified as transgender, 31% um, as non-binary, and then about 8% as questioning or unsure. And you'll see that um, uh, students who identify as male and transgender uh, outnumber students who identify as female and transgender by a pretty wide margin. But the cisgender and the cisgender students, female students outnumber the male students. And then demographically. So about 67% of students in the Glisten sample um, identify as white, um, about 16% Hispanic or Latinx, and only about 3.3% African American or black. So this is um, this is important to highlight because obviously the Glisten sample is underrepresenting black or African American students in the United States. And we don't really know the reason for that. Uh, it may have something to do with lack of access to LGBTQ plus um, supported groups um, that might exist in certain communities. We don't really know, but it's important to keep that in mind as we look at this data to sort of put it in that perspective. So the first piece of data I want to share with you um, is from this bar chart, which shows us the percentage of LGBTQ plus students who said they felt unsafe at school because of actual or perceived personal characteristics. So this first bar shows us that 82% of students, so more than four out of five, said that they felt unsafe at school for some reason having to do with who they are. And that 68% said they felt unsafe for some reason having to do with their SOGIE characteristics, sexual orientation, or gender identity or expression. So again, um, large percentage of students say they feel unsafe at school for reasons associated with their sexual orientation or gender identity. Oops. And 
I'm just, uh, this is a very confusing looking graph, but these are all from the Western report, but I'm just going to highlight one data point here. And that is, if you remember um, on the last slide, it said 68% of students um, said they felt unsafe for reasons associated with their sexual orientation or gender identity. For transgender students, that's 74%. That's this triangle right here. And transgender boys, it's 77%. So transgender students are even more likely than their LGBTQ plus peers to say that they feel unsafe at school. So um, the law school at UCLA um, has a center where it estimates um, the number of LGBTQ plus young people in the United States. And they estimate that at about 1.9 million. So if this statistic of 82% is correct, then we're talking about more than 1.5 million young people who right now, as I'm giving this talk, don't feel safe in their schools. Oops, slides are going two at a time here. So why don't LGBTQ plus youth feel safe at school? What's happening? Um, well, 68% say they hear homophobic or transphobic language either frequently or often, according to the listening survey. 80% say they've been verbally harassed at school or on school grounds. And 33% have been physically harassed. And these harassment numbers are even higher for transgender youth. Now, when students are harassed, um, one of the things that we obviously want them to be doing is reporting that. But these uh, charts show us that the majority of students do not report. Um, this bar chart here on the left shows us um, that 58%, 57.9% never report when they're harassed to a family member. Now, the reasons for that could be everything from they're not out to family members. It's probably one of the main reasons. Um, uh, and they just don't feel safe doing that. Um, but even with school staff, it's more than six out of 10 say they don't report. Um, so again, we, it's important to know why that would be the case. And on the right, also it's showing us that um, almost half of students say that when they talk to their family members about being harassed, they don't respond. They don't intervene with the school. So these are the reasons why LGBTQ plus students said they didn't report. And as you might suspect, the top reason why students say they don't report is they didn't think the school staff would do anything about it. That was almost 70%. Um, other kind of noteworthy things on this bar chart, I mean, you may see other things, but um, about halfway down, 47% were too embarrassed or ashamed to report it. And 45% didn't think the harassment was serious enough. So what we are teaching students about what they can expect at school um, and what is sort of expected behavior and what they just have to tolerate um, it's kind of sobering to see that. Uh, second from the bottom, being concerned for their safety, 40%. And 29% said they didn't report because there were homophobic or transphobic school staff in the schools. So what are the consequences of this? What are the consequences of students um, not feeling safe at school? So these are the spaces that students in the Glisten survey said they were most likely to avoid because they felt unsafe or uncomfortable. So bathrooms, uh, bathrooms, locker rooms, physical education or gym class, school athletic fields or facilities, and the cafeteria or lunchroom were the most, most frequently cited places where students said that they felt unsafe um, and that they avoided. So what do we notice about these places? Well, for one thing, they tend to be the less supervised spaces in the school. Um, they also, three of them have to do with athletics, locker rooms, phys ed, and school athletic fields or facilities. Um, 
they tend to be gendered. Uh, bathrooms, locker rooms are gendered. Physical education is often gendered, as are school athletic fields or facilities. And um, they also tend to be spaces, at least those first four, that have something to do with students' bodies. Um, so again, lots of reasons why students might be answering the questions this way. But just um, it helps to sort of take a step back and sort of imagine um, what might be some of the common threads among these, these places where students say they avoid them because they feel unsafe. So other consequences. So the left pie chart shows us where students are avoiding uh, school functions or extracurricular activities because they feel unsafe or uncomfortable. So if we look at the left pie chart, um, between frequently, often, and sometimes, more than half of students are saying there are certain school functions or activities that they avoid because they feel unsafe or uncomfortable. And on the right pie chart, we see students, um, how frequently they miss days of school because of feeling unsafe or uncomfortable. So the good news is that more than two thirds of students, 67.8%, um, say that they don't miss any school. But here, the rest of this pie chart, we see that about a third are missing either one day, 8.2%, or up to six or more days of school, 7.6% because they feel unsafe or uncomfortable for reasons associated with their sexual orientation or gender identity. And 16.2% um, of LGBTQ plus students reported changing schools because they felt unsafe or uncomfortable. So rather than the school changing, rather than the school addressing the problems that the students are highlighting, that are reporting, um, or not reporting, students are counseled sometimes to leave their schools. And I've done qualitative studies where I've interviewed young people, and this um, I've heard this over and over from students that they have left schools because of how that how the what the atmosphere was like. So now we want to look beyond near safety, right? Because when I asked you to fill in the blank. Uh, a few minutes ago, yes, the word safe came up, but a lot of other things came up too. So safety, if you think about it, is a pretty low bar for what we want students to be experiencing at school, right? We want to be, we want them to ex be experiencing a lot of other things. Um, just sort of looking back at what we had in the Q&A, I see words like welcome, belonging, affirmed, uh, fully actualized, um, empowered, free to learn. So there are a lot of other things we want beyond making students feel safe. So how are we doing at providing those things? So this pie chart on the left shows us the percentage of students who said there was any representation of anything LGBTQ plus related in their school curriculum. So the vast majority, 72%, said there was no representation at all, nothing. No discussion of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, anything ever at school. Um, and another 12.2% said there was, but it was only negative. Um, so messages say in sexuality education, which happened in certain states, um, teaching that Homosexuality is not an acceptable lifestyle. I mean, this is on the books in some states. Um, so only 14% of students said that there was only positive um, discussion of LGBTQ plus identities, and 2.2% there was both positive and negative. So again, the vast majority of students are saying it's basically silent around LGBTQ plus issues at their schools. And this is a statistic that has barely budged in the 20-some years of the Glisten survey. So we've seen some improvement in terms of the harassment data, in terms of students feeling safe. As bad as the numbers are now, they were actually worse 20 years ago. But this, um, these data on inclusive curriculum have barely budged in the 20 years of the Glisten survey. Um, so something is not 
translating. And and this is before the don't say gay laws. So and don't say trans laws. Um, and I'll talk about that more in a couple of minutes. Um, other academic resources that students, um, many students say that they don't have. So only 16.5% said there were any textbooks or assigned readings with LGBTQ plus content. Um, only 43% there was like, there were live said there were library resources and 48% said they had internet access to LGBTQ plus content. So the vast majority said they didn't. Um, and another um, marker of an LGBTQ plus um, affirming school is um, what is frequently called a GSA. So that can stand for a gender and sexuality alliance or a gay straight alliance, but it's an after school student club um, that students can participate in and to hang out, uh, eat snacks, plan programming for the school, um, just a space where students feel like they don't have to hide and they can do themselves. But most students in the Glisten survey um, said that they didn't have access to one of those that was active in their school. And that was particularly the case in the South um, and, and in the Midwest. And, and more schools in the Northeast and in the, on the West Coast had GSAs, but still not all. Sexuality education. Um, a bit of a swamp when it comes to um, LGBTQ plus inclusion. So we see here that 30% of students in the Glisten survey said they had no sexuality education at all. Um, and this is consistent with other surveys. Uh, another 57% said they had sexuality education, but it didn't include any lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender or non-binary topics. So only about um, less than uh, less about thirteen percent said there was any sexuality education with LGB or transgender non-binary topics in what they said at school. So basically, one in ten. Out uh, teachers and school staff. Uh, more than half the students in the Glisten survey said um, there were none. Um, 58% said they didn't know of any openly LGBTQ plus teachers or school staff at their schools. And uh, a lot of surveys, uh, both quantitative and qualitative, um, have suggested that having at least that one teacher who students can relate to, who they can sort of talk to about anything, um, is a really important factor in students feel, feeling a sense of belonging. Um, and then it was another 22% who said, well, okay, there was one teacher. Um, but the vast majority of, um, of students said there, it, there was either less than, less than one or uh, not at all. So now this is one more set of, uh, of numbers that I want to share with you. And these are not, this is not from the Glisten survey. This is from the Centers for Disease Controls. Um, National Users Behavior Survey, which is done in randomly selected high schools around the United States every two years. Um, this data was also collected in 2021. And they found that 45% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth have seriously considered suicide, and 22% report that they've attempted suicide in the year prior to the survey. And the National um, Users Behavior Survey did not include a question about transgender identity, um, which is a, a major deficit in the survey. I believe they're planning to include one in the, in the next survey. Um, and some cities and states have done local users behavior surveys where they've included the question, but indications are that the, um, the numbers for suicide attempts um, and ideation are higher for transgender youth than for lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth. The Trevor Project reported recently that more than half of transgender youth had seriously considered suicide. Now, the data, um, as I said at the beginning, um, the data from GLSEN 
um, under report on Black and African American LGBTQ plus youth. So I wanted to share um, a few data from a survey that Human Rights Campaign did in 2019, um, which found that 40% of Black and African American LGBTQ youth um, said they had been bullied on school property in the last 12 months. Only 32% said they always felt safe in the classroom. About 21%, um, which is consistent with the other data, said they heard positive messages about being LGBTQ in school. 20% only received inclusive sexuality education. 67% um, had been verbally insulted. Um, and 82% for transgender youth. And 30% had been physically threatened. And 41% for transgender youth. And finally, um, this is a piece of data from uh, the Trevor Project as well um, that looked at um, American Indian, Alaskan Native uh, youth suicide risk. And they found that 34% of um, American Indian, Alaskan Native youth had attempted suicide in the previous year. So much higher than the LGBTQ plus population in general. So I know that's a lot of data. It's a lot of heavy data. Um, so I want to go back to our words here. I want to go back to our um, to the fill in the blank that I asked you to do at the beginning. So again, here were the words that here are the words that you shared: welcome, accepted, free to learn, and think about. What does the data tell us about whether these things are happening? You can view these, I think, in the um, in the in the Q and A. Um, powered, loved, welcomed, supported, deserve to feel safe, belonging, valued, affirmed, will be actualized. Um, and yes, my slides will be available. Um, so we are not doing very well um by lgbtq plus youth in this country i think um you know we'll obviously have a discussion about this afterward but i think probably most of you after hearing all that data um would agree with that now this would probably be the part where i would say okay these numbers are a disgrace um they are an embarrassment in the united states of america what i'm going to say instead is that they probably underrepresent the problem and the reason that they underrepresent the problem is that we now have a wave of laws in states around the country um, that have been passed, most of which have been passed since this data was collected. So the most recent available data from GLSEN and from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey is 2021. And we've seen this wave since then uh, of all these states in the orange passing these don't say gay or trans laws of one kind or another. So on this map, um, the states in the darker orange are the states where these laws um, are in effect. This is from the Movement Advancement Project, by the way. They do a terrific job mapping all these different um, all these different issues, especially as they relate to youth and updating them in real time. Uh, they're a terrific resource. Um, but again, the darker orange is where these laws are now in effect. And the lighter orange is where um, parental permission is required for students to study anything LGBTQ plus related, which in many places probably means that they won't study it at all. So as many of you probably know, especially those of you in Florida, um, the don't say gay or trans law, um, which actually the, the real name is the um, Parental Rights and Education Act, was amended um, to go beyond pre-kindergarten through grade three. Uh, now it's through grades in grades four through 12, instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity is prohibited unless such instruction is either expressly required by state academic standards or as part of a reproductive health courts or health lesson for which a student's parent has the option to have his or, his or her student not attend. Now, in most places, um, 
that probably means that again that this instruction just won't happen at all um because we're going to talk a little bit uh, in a few minutes about the chilling effect that these laws have even beyond um what they actually state and even beyond the places where they actually are in effect I was reading an article in Education Week um, not too long ago, and I ran across this quote from a student at a high school in Florida that really struck me. Um, the student said, we can feel when we're not welcome, as any person can, and legislation like this tells certain students that they're not welcome. So state laws that make students feel unwelcome in their schools. Bathroom use. Um, these are laws where students are barred from using bathrooms that are in accordance with their um, asserted gender identity at school. So most of these states are in orange. Florida is in red. Um, Florida's law um, goes a little further. I have to read it from a piece of paper because there are so many restrictions. I can't keep track of it. Um, the state bans transgender people from using bathrooms and facilities consistent with their gender identity in all schools, colleges, and government-owned buildings and spaces, and makes it a criminal offense for transgender people to use bathrooms or facilities consistent with their gender identity. So according to the Movement and Advancement Project, that's the law in Florida right now. Um, Bans on trans youth in sports. So these are the states in orange. Um, 23 states now have um, bans in effect that in some way or another uh, prevent transgender youth from participating in sports in accordance with their gender identity. And these are on top of all the laws um, banning gender-affirming care, which the American Medical Association has called medically necessary for trans youth. Um, I didn't put, I'm not going to put a map up of that because it's a pretty confusing map. There are all sorts of different conditions and, and court cases. And, um, so, but, but that map is, is pretty well filled in as well. But, okay. So again, a lot of heavy data, a lot of, um, sobering data, but LGBTQ plus youth also demonstrate resilience and resistance. Um, I like this definition of resilience, um, broadly defined as the successful achievement of developmental tasks and or demonstration of positive adaptation for adjustment, despite adversity, challenges, stress, trauma, or toxic environments. So in spite of all of these things that are going on, um, there's a lot of resilience out there among LGBTQ plus youth. Um, as sobering as it is that 22% of LGB youth have committed have, have attempted suicide. Um, it's important to remember that seventy eight percent have not. It's important to remember that um, more than half of trans youth have not attempted suicide. So, what is it that allows students to be resilient in the face of all this negativity? And how can we help students um, develop the skills to resist? And how can we resist ourselves when we see such a um, such a sobering and daunting um, set of conditions and set of laws out there that only seem to be making things worse um, day after day. So how do we do this? How do we resist and foster resilience? I'm just going to offer a few ideas. Um, and there are many. And not all of them are possible everywhere. So what I'm going I'm to say a little bit about inclusive curriculum now, you look at the laws in Florida, and obviously that's problematic. Um, and when we have a panel next week, um, we have folks who are going to talk about um, ways that they are pushing back against that, even in places um, where it doesn't seem um, that that's possible. Um, but there's still, even with that, there's still ways that we can resist these things and foster resilience among young people. So, first thing I'm going to suggest to be on the alert for self-censorship. Now, we all know about the censorship that's out there. Uh, I think there's a session tomorrow with Jonathan Friedman, who is very involved um, in fighting book bans um, around the country that are going on right now everywhere. 
many of the titles um, that are being banned have to do with um, LGBTQ plus people or issues, um, probably books about gender and sexuality and books about race are probably the most banned out there right now. Um, the, the Florida Department of Education recently reported that more than 300 different titles were banned in the last school year, many of them because they related to um, issues of gender and sexuality. And you can find the list online. Um, all the titles are listed there. So obviously censorship is um is a major issue that we're that we're fighting against right now but there's also this thing of self-censorship that i want to talk about um the ray corporation did a very interesting and and thoughtful study um this year where they talked to teachers about their choices around gender and race in the face of all these laws and one of the things that they found that is frightening is that about a quarter of U.S. teachers are shifting how they talk about gender and race in the classroom, including teachers in states that have not enacted restrictive policies. So even in states where these laws aren't in effect, some teachers are making choices as if they were. And um, again, some of the panelists are going to talk about that uh, next week. Teachers say restrictive policies have made them more hesitant to introduce students to book characters or identify as LGBTQ, to discuss same-sex marriage or diverse family structures, and to display pride flags, all shifts that are likely to send negative messages to LGBTQ plus youth. That's from the Red Corporation. So before I move on to the next one, I should say, so we need to be on the alert for this kind of self-censorship, this kind of um, this kind of over-interpreting of these laws. Like they use language like age inappropriate to sort of intimidate teachers into not knowing what exactly what that means and therefore they don't teach anything. Um, so, so just really thinking about um, how do we push back against the self-censorship that can come um, from these kinds of laws being in effect and the chilling effect that can have. So again, this may not work in Florida right now, um, or there may be ways, I don't know, but push for inclusive teaching and laws where it's possible. So this is the curriculum map I showed you a few minutes ago, and now I want you to focus on the green states. Um, Oregon, California, Nevada, Colorado, Illinois, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Um, these states now have laws that require the inclusion of LGBTQ plus curriculum in state um, curriculum standards. So more states need to be doing this. Um, there's a bill coming through the New York State Senate right now, um, co-sponsored by Michelle Hinchy, who's um, my state senator, um, calling for New York to adopt a similar requirement that schools um, be inclusive in including the um, experiences and histories of LGBTQ plus individuals. So if if teachers are feeling a chilling effect in states where this isn't hap where these laws aren't in effect, then it would it would be beneficial for states, uh, for state governments to make clear that this kind of inclusion isn't just okay, but that it's expected, that it's required. Uh, so that's an important thing that we can do going forward. I want to share this from, uh, I know this teacher uh, who teaches um, at Amherst Regional High School in Massachusetts. She's taught this course in LGBTQ plus literature for 20 years. This is a statement from her syllabus. Students in public schools have been reading literary classics by LGBTQ authors for more than a century. However, these authors' lives are often concealed rather than rightfully explored. This course closely examines the struggles and triumphs of these artists as well as in the historical periods in which they wrote, allowing readers to more deeply analyze their diverse literary contributions. Now, granted, this is Amherst, Massachusetts, right? A very liberal college town. But when you read when you read this excerpt, excerpt from the syllabus, it sounds like the kind of, you know, um, honest accounting of literary history that we want all kids to have. This is another thing I want to share with you. Um, it's not really, it's 
doesn't really relate to classroom teaching, but it relates to a school um, teaching students uh, in ways that are affirming of their identities. This is a display that um, was at Jericho High School in on Long Island a few years ago in honor of National Coming Out Day. So each of these doors symbolizes um, a different aspect of to, to symbolize that that we don't just come out once, but that coming out is a lifelong journey. So this was in the school lobby. Anybody who came through the door um, had to walk through one of these doors to get to another place in the building. So the first door um, represents, say it's supposed to be like a bedroom door. So this represents yourself, coming out to yourself. The second door um, is coming out to family. Uh, the third door um, looks like a school that's coming out to, I guess, the locker. So coming out to the people at school. Uh, and the fourth door is the faith community, if you have one. The fifth door is college um, with all the banners and um, and such. And the last door um, is, has, says employees only up here. So it's, a, it's supposed to represent a workplace. So um, all these different places that we have to come out over and over throughout our lives. And in each door, as you walked up to each door, there's a message inside. So this was the one in the one that represented the self. The bedroom symbolizes safety, personal space, and reflection. The first person you come out to is yourself. This is the beginning of your journey to becoming your authentic you. Stand tall, be proud. So we probably won't be seeing a lot of displays like this in Florida anytime soon. But imagine if we did, and imagine what that kid feels like, maybe who's struggling with their identity, walking through one of these doors on their way to class. The third thing we can do is find allies. They're out there, and it can often seem like they're not out there. Um, these are some cleverly worded uh, names of legislation or organizations out there. Parental rights and education law. That's what they call the one in Florida. My child, my choice. That was the bill. That's the bill in Oklahoma. Moms for Liberty. It's a national organization that's working to infiltrate school boards and um, and press for non-inclusive uh, policies. So these, this language sort of deliberately positions parents' rights and support for LGBTQ plus kids as being at odds. But six in 10 parents oppose restrictions on LGBTQ lessons in elementary school, according to an ABC News poll. So parent allies are out there. There are parents and guardians who want their kids to learn inclusive history and literature. They want their kids who might be queer to be supported at school. So. Um, parents and guardians and family members are out there. If you want to advocate for queer youth, um, they can perhaps do it with you. Support youth in knowing and exercising their rights. Um, there are some federal laws that protect the rights of LGBTQ plus youth. So we've got all these state laws going on now, but Queer youth have a lot of laws that, that back them up. First Amendment, free speech and expression. Um, in some ways, um, students' free expression is feels a little more protected in some places now than teachers. Um, the Fourth Amendment, equal protection under the law. That's a given. That's, that can be applied in all sorts of scenarios. And finally, the Equal Access Act, and not a lot of people know about this one. But... A lot of schools, especially now, will either shy away from after school LGBTQ plus youth groups or um, try to shut them down. But actually, the Equal Access Act was invoked in, in, in the 1980s to protect religious groups that wanted to meet on school grounds. And um, the court found that, um, that religious school organizations had to be given access to school facilities um, in what's called a limited public forum 
if the school was giving facilities to other school groups. So they could not discriminate based on content. They had equal access. So this Equal Access Act has been invoked in many cases to protect gay straight alliances and gender and sexuality alliances. So if a school is um, making special rules to keep GSAs out, that's in violation of the Equal Access Act. Students exercising their First Amendment rights. This is Winter Park High School in Florida, a recent walkout in protest of don't say gay and trans laws. This is a protest also in Florida. Finally, or almost finally, vote. Tomorrow is election day. Um, there are obviously um, candidates and, and um, elected officials out there who would continue to and do more to abridge the rights of LGBTQ plus youth in schools and silence their voices and their identities. And there are candidates who would. So voting now is especially important. And the last thing you can do, well, there are many things you can do, but the last thing I'm going to talk about that you can do is attend next week's panel. Um, so next week, this time, 4 o'clock on Monday, um, Simone Chris, who's director of the Transgender Rights Initiative in Florida for the Southern Legal Council, is going to be with us. Um, Simone has um, has argued many cases in this area, particularly um, as they affect um trans youth access to gender affirming care, um, don't say gay and trans laws. Simone is a real um, trailblazer out there in terms of fighting these things in the state of Florida. Um, Clark Wolf Hamill, who also happens to be a Bard graduate, uh, is education director of PFLAG New York City. Uh, Clark's going to be talking about um, some of the things that he has seen, even in New York City, that um, where, again, um, there are the, the chilling effect that these kinds of laws are having, um, even in places where they're not in effect, um, and how that's affected his work. Um, Alyssa Waters is the director of LGBT Teach. Um, Alyssa is also um, uh, a teacher at the school that had the um, national coming out display of the six doors in the lobby. But uh, Alyssa has experienced um, some backlash uh, from a national organization that many of you have probably heard of called Project Veritas with the work that she does with LGBT. Um, so these folks are going to be, yes, telling you their stories of how um, conservative groups and other folks have tried to shut them down, but they're also going to be talking about um, how they think about their work going forward and how we can continue to advocate for queer youth even in this climate. Um, I'm going to be joined by um, Carla Stevens as my co-moderator of the panel. Carla is director of the brand new uh, Bard Queer Leadership Project, which is a uh, horrific um, uh, degree program now being offered at Simons Rock College um, in Massachusetts for students who are interested in uh, becoming queer leaders. When Carla's on next week, she can she can tell you more officially and fully what BQLP is all about. Uh, but again, that's Monday, November 13th at 4 p.m. So with that, um, I'd love to hear and respond to your questions, your comments, um, anything you might have. Thanks. And I'll, I'll stop the share so we can see each other a little better. Uh, thank you, Michael, for such an excellent presentation and for ending on a high note. We are going to be continuing the conversation next week. Um, but yeah, now we invite the audience to submit any questions, any thoughts they might have. I'd actually like to get started with a question of my own, if that's all right. Um, earlier in the presentation, we saw some data about uh, how little um, LGBTQ plus students um, tend to report um, any harassment that they face while in schools um, to staff. And uh, I, it got me wondering, do we have any data specific to whether um, educators are given the resources in the first place to help? LGBTQ plus students if they come to them with these sort of concerns. Um, I, I just, is the infrastructure even here to help these students in the first place? Or does it seem like we're also lacking in that sense? Generally speaking, it is not. 
I, I hate to say it. Um, there have been studies of this, of the um, relative rarity of LGBTQ plus um, training and, and education for teacher candidates. And certainly like both pre-service while teachers are, are, are in say graduate school and in service while they're working in their buildings. Um, it often, you know, there may be one-off workshops in some places that there probably isn't anything in other places. Um, but training for LGBTQ plus, um, for, for, for teachers to feel prepared to work with LGBTQ plus students and advocate for that is pretty sorely lacking. I'd like to think we do a good job of that art, but that's, I think, a career thing. Hey. Sort of a, a similar question, but maybe you'll have a similar answer too. I'm also wondering if there's any data specific to school counselors, if that is maybe a, a different category from educators or administrators, um, if, they, if or if we're just getting more of the same, sort of a lack of support and a lack of uh, students feeling that they can turn to these figures in the first place. Yeah, I'm not, I know that there are studies out there of school counselors. Um, I'm not as familiar with those. Um, but I want to, I want to go back to actually to what you said before, because I mean, it's, it's really chilling if you stop and think about the, I, I don't mean to be talking about Florida all the time, but if you think about the restrictions in higher ed in Florida now. So people who are in teacher training in Florida are probably not learning anything about how to support LGBTQ plus kids in school. And people are going into the teaching profession, never having had that conversation. And that that is frightening. I mean, it it's it's bad enough that it's such a problem around the country. I mean, even in places where they don't have laws like they have in Florida, there's not much going on. Um, but to think about the way the laws have affected higher ed in Florida, and that that includes teacher training and teacher education programs at the bachelor's and master's level is really chilly. And I, uh, I don't blame you for circling back to Florida. It's kind of difficult to avoid uh, what's happening to my home state in this conversation. Um, we do have a question from Mike Sand who wants to know, um, are there any historical surveys of how this has changed over time, either having been done contemporaneously or asking adults about their past? So I think what Mike is asking is, do we have data for how, how the landscape has evolved in terms of LGBTQ plus student support in our public schools? Yes, that's a great question. Glisten does this. They, um, if you if you Google 2021 Glisten GLSEN School Climate Survey, you can read the full report in PDF. Um, it's 200 some pages, and they have um, they have longitudinal tables in there that show how things have changed over time. Um, as I said earlier, the the um, the data on harassment, even the data on suicide, it was worse, you know, 20, 30 years ago. This really started getting studied, I'd say, in the late 1980s. It's the beginning, beginning um, of looking at these issues among youth. Um, before that, you know, there was, people were afraid to touch it because, you know, there were all these I mean, as there, as there are now, I mean, they use the word groomer now, you know, they use all different words back then. Um, but, um, so you see, if you look at the, so in the back of the Glisten report, there are all these things that show how some of these data points have changed over time and on harassment, on frequency of hearing homophobic language at school, the data have gotten a little bit better, a little bit, they're still mad, but they've gotten a little bit better on that curriculum piece, it's all a flat line, um, which sort of, and, and again, we don't even know, we don't know what the 2023, like they're collecting data now to come out in 2024. And that's when we're going to start seeing the effects of these don't say gay and trans laws. So 
we may very well see a decline in that curriculum number and, and a decline in, in a lot of these other numbers as well. Um, the other thing I'll say about talking to adults retrospectively is um, I did a qualitative study, um, actually for my doctoral dissertation, I turned into a book, um, where I talked to LGBTQ plus youth. I mean, this is a while ago. So this was um, the early aughts when these students were high school students. Um, and then I talked to them again six or seven years later as young adults to look at the evolution of what I call their queer voice and how the experiences that they had um, as high school students kind of influenced who they were and how their voice changed over time and as a and and what factors may have contributed to the way they talk about their queer identity now. So it's called the queer voice if you're interested. It's out there. Great, thank you. Um, on a bit on a bit more positive note, we have another question coming in from Jonathan Becker who wants to know: um, Can you speak of some models of laws and some states that are helpful to the LGBTQ plus community? Uh, where are some communities? Where are these communities treated best, and what is being done to pass those laws? California is is it used to be Massachusetts and now California is kind of the model. Um, they have a law, um, you know, they they were I believe they were the first to have a law requiring LGBTQ plus inclusion in curriculum. They have all these resources that they've created that anybody in any school can use. So you, so you don't have to be in California. There are lesson plans. There are handouts and it's really amazing um i try to remember the name of the url and i can't but california has a great um arsenal of lgbtq plus positive lesson plans and and curriculum that are out there for anybody to use they also have the most um the, i believe again the first and the most um comprehensive law protecting trans youth in terms of access to um, school facilities, access to school sports, use of pronouns. Um, in California, New York has what's called a guidance, which is good. It tells teachers from the, um, from the, from the state education department, this is what we expect you to be doing to serve trans youth. And it's all the same things that they talk about in California. But in California, it's against the law to not use the student's pronouns. It's against the law to to um, report them to their parents and so on. It's against the law to um, bar students from using facilities. It's against the law to have a single stall restroom that's not unisex. Um, not any in the school anywhere. Um, but other states, Oregon, Colorado, Illinois, these all have inclusive curriculum laws too. New, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, we're working on in New York. Great. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to butt in with another question of my own, um, just because I can't help myself. And um, So earlier in your presentation, um, you touched on um, the chilling effect that a lot of this legislation has, uh, the ways that this kind of ambiguous wording um, can scare people into self-censoring. Um, and we also talked a little bit about um, GSAs, Gay Straight Alliances, and how, in a sense, they are kind of federally protected. But are we seeing that chilling effect reach GSAs? Do we have data on that? Um, I can say from my own experience, uh, the GSA at my high school was kind of unfortunately treated like a joke by the community. Students would sign each other up like as a prank. To join the GSA, um, which is unfortunate, but I'm wondering if there's a larger trend of that. That that specifically, I don't know. But here's what I'm going to say about that. I mean, there was a there was a, a reading that I assigned for my LGBTQ plus issues in education class. It's called Street Level Bureaucrats, and it says that the, the it's sort of a political theory that. There may be a policy, but the real meaning of the policy is what happens on the ground. You know, what, what are the people on the street actually doing? And that 
when it comes to schools, teachers and principals are the street level bureaucrats. So the law can be whatever it is, but what they're doing is what's actually what the meaning of the law really is in reality for students. Um, so what was the original question? Um, right. I was curious as to whether um, the chilling effect of these laws has reached things like GSAs or even more broadly, if we want to talk about like student um, initiatives as opposed to initiatives run by uh, the institution itself. Yes. So now I know where, where I was headed with that idea about street level bureaucrats. So GSAs are a perfect example of that, that I, I don't know of any data on this, but I would suspect very strongly that there is an effect of students feeling they can't start GSAs, they can't keep GSAs, of principals thinking they can shut GSAs down with impunity. I think probably all of that is going on out there because of this street level bureaucrat thing that, 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 that the real authority in a school building lies with the, or as it can be perceived that the real authority lies with the administration. And if they are nervous in any way, risk averse, they will shut a GSA down, um, or attempt to, or try to keep it quiet. Um, so I, don't know for sure, but I would strongly suspect that this these laws are having an effect on GSA school organizations, pride flags, um, days of silence, um, all sorts of things. Right. Um, very quick, we have um, a member in the chat, Mitch Silverman, who is also a graduate of New College, my alma mater as well, and a lawyer who's asking um, if he could reach out after the event for a citation on that specific a street level bureaucracy article you reference. Sure thing. Sure thing. Be glad to. Be glad to share that. I I might want to I might want to see that too. Um I'll try to remember to, to bug you about it. Uh, we uh, have another question in from Yu Chi who asks about um Blessings 2021 report, how it actually does have some findings related to trends, uh related to the availability of GSAs. So that's another resource um for folks. To check out. Yes, that's very true. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Still accepting questions for the next however long we can keep the conversation going, I suppose. Um, I I would really like to ask you a bit about um, your book, uh, a bit about um, Safe is Not Enough. And the title itself strikes me because based on the data we've seen today, we, we haven't even hit that bare minimum of these students feeling safe in their schools. And so kind of the million dollar question feels like, what would it take to even just hit that bare minimum of safety before we can even begin to dream of a more inclusive educational environment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, the title almost seems anachronistic to me now, if that's the right word, or it seems... You know, I, I collected the data for that book in 2015. It came out fast. It came out in 2016, which is unusual. Um, but that was the time when we didn't have all these laws that are going on now. But the point that I was making was that, I mean, sort of historically, support for LGBTQ plus youth and school programming was always framed around this safe schools thing. Um, that's, you know, any any advocate from the 90s, um, having been one, you know, will tell you that. Um, and that was necessary at the time because it had to be framed in a way that people would support it. Um, who could argue with safe schools, right? Um, but then we sort of got stuck in this safe schools mindset that our job is to make sure that LGBTQ plus youth are safe. Well, again, it's a pretty low bar <laughs> for what we want kids to be experiencing at school. So, um, so I wanted to call the book Safe is Not Enough. Um, and Kevin Jennings, who founded Glisten, wrote the foreword to the book and said, this has gnawed at me for 
30 years, and I'm glad somebody finally said it, that, that, that safe isn't enough, that we should be doing better. We had to call it safe. Kevin was, you know, like probably the main, one of the main advocates back then. Um, and, but we had to call it, but, but really like, again, all those words that people put in the Q and A affirmed, um, supported to learn, you know, all these things that, you know, these, these higher things that we want schools to be about, um, so often when we, you know, when we talk about LGBTQ students, it's about, you know, it's the bar is lowered and it's keeping them safe. But if we really want kids to be at burned, that implies we have to have inclusive curriculum. We have to have GSAs. We have to have all these other things. Um, so now we're in a place where like just getting to safe in some places is a challenge, you know, um, and that's unfortunate, but I did a TEDx talk recently, which should be online in the next week or two, maybe a little bit more, I'm not sure, but, um, and I call it safe is still not enough because even amid all these things that are going on, um, we still have to ask, we still have to expect more than that. We still have to insist on schools for queer youth being every bit as identity supportive as it is for every other kid. Thank you so much for that. And I'm glad that you touched on that TEDx talk because I was also hoping to circle back to it. Oh, yeah. Um, very fantastic. I, I look forward to seeing it as soon as it's available. Um, let's see. Maybe um, kind of on the topic of safety, um, we also have some folks um, commenting um, about Moms for Liberty, which for those of us that are also in Florida are familiar with the Sarasota area, it's kind of become... Uh, Moms for Liberty's headquarters, in a sense. They actually recently opened up, or no, I'm sorry, Moms for Liberty did not open up an office, but Bridget Ziegler, sort of the the face of the movement, opened up um, an office in partnership with a different, uh, very similar group with the goal of uh, recruiting more conservative folks to school boards. Um, and and groups like Mom for Liberty, Moms for Liberty stand out because of this parental rights ethos kind of seems to contradict the idea of safety for students, or, or it takes the idea of safety for students and sort of wields it as a weapon against other students. I don't know if you have any more thoughts on that. Well, yeah. I mean, they they frame this as protecting children, right? They frame it as parents' rights, but they also frame it as protecting children. That word groomers is very deliberately chose it. Um, so their idea of safe, you know, it's almost like they're pushing their own idea of safe when in fact, those of us who, you know, either have lived it or have, you know, known queer youth and, but we know that safe is actually being affirmed and being, you know, um, that it's not safe to be silenced that, um, you know, you see those suicide statistics of, of LGBTQ youth, and you and you think about the places where um, students don't have anybody to talk to about it. You know the isolation that goes with that. Like the the going back to Inner Queer Voice, that book that I did based on my dissertation. Um, that's what a lot of the people talked about. They talked about because some of them did talk about suicidal attempts and ideation. Even though I didn't, that wasn't the topic of my research. I was asking about relationships and I got all this stuff about suicide attempts and, and suicidality, suicide ideation. Um, and they, when they talked about it, they always talked about relationship and connection as the thing that brought them out. Um, it was it was feeling isolated. It was feeling like they had nobody that they could relate to or talk to that um, in some ways, I won't say led them to that place because it's complex, but it certainly contributed. Um, yeah, this is um, this is interesting, actually. Uh, Mitch Silverman is sharing some information in our Q&A actually about 
I think this happened just today or yesterday, a Moms for Liberty uh, member um, going to the sheriff's office in order to report a librarian, um, I believe, over uh, stalking a young adult fantasy novel that this this member took issue with. And and here I think we kind of see this uh this intersection of, you know, we have we have these topics of parents' rights and keeping children safe coming into contact with hot topics like book banning. Um we see all of these these things coming together. Um I'm wondering if you have any more comments about kind of this idea of a, a lack of availability for for information for young queer students and how that plays into all of this. If, if you don't even have the resources to put a name to what you're feeling, how how do you cope with it? Yeah, I mean, school libraries, as we saw, you know, most students are, do not have access to materials. So many schools, um, and I imagine this is really widespread in places like Florida, have um, filters on internet access so that students can't um, get to certain websites um, if you go to the Listen website now, I've been seeing this on especially youth-related LGBTQ websites. It will say, there's like a safe out thing. Click the escape button three times for quick to get off of this website fast. Um, because they know that people are watching, you know. Um, so, I mean, librarians, I've always been, but I've, I've really been heroes in this thing. You know, the American Library Association, um, their sort of freedom to read uh, branch, the Office for Intellectual Freedom. Um, and again, put another plug in for the talk tomorrow, Pan America um, is really out there pushing back against some of these book bans. Um, but yeah, you're right. Access to information, access to something, it's, it's that isolation. Um, if I don't see or read anything, that reflects who I am, who am I, you know? And I guess, yes, we have things like Netflix now, where we have things, you know, that we have the internet that, you know, people can access, but it's it's not the same as being affirmed in the place where you go to school. Right, absolutely. Uh, we have another contribution from Mitch who would like to know, are there any statistics about chronic depression, not situational, but persisting, triggered by environmental factors or abuse among queer students and adults? Oh, mm -hmm. uh, gosh. I'm not a psychologist. Um, I'm trying to remember, though, if I had seen anything like that. Um, there are studies on um, queer adults and um, on how their experiences as youth um, have sort of carried over into their adulthood and many of them and and, and sort of elevated um, elevated I can't I wish I could give you citations and authors I can't but there yes there are studies out there of young adults even middle-aged people I think um, about their mental health indicating that sort of persistent homophobia or transphobia that they've experienced in their lives um, has been a stress-inducing and therefore risk factor for them. Yeah, I would like to... Um, I'm hoping to turn the conversation around to something a little more positive. I I'd like to kind of dwell on some of those images you shared of those, those massive protests um, at some high schools here in Florida against some of this censorous legislation, um, some of the actions that that young people are taking against this. Do you have um, perhaps any concrete next steps for a, a hypothetical student who, you know, is upset with uh, the way things are going and would like some change? How would a young person, you know, go about uh, trying to to f seek support for themselves or for their peers in this environment? Gosh, I mean, it's it's very humbling for me to think about that question because here I sit on the Bard College campus in New York, you know what I mean? Um, where I don't have to worry about this anymore. Um, but I will draw an ancient history to answer this question. When I was a high school teacher in the 1990s, 
And we were trying to start a gay straight alliance in the school in Massachusetts, which, you know, it was Massachusetts. Um, and we were getting pushback from the administration. The thing that I did um, was I made phone calls and I found the people who could advise me on what my rights were and what the students' rights were, really. I mean, they were coming to me asking if I would be the advisor. We were all sort of shut down. Um, and it was very helpful to have a conversation with some kind of advocate at a larger level, whether that's a state person, an ACLU person, a GLSEN person, a PFLAG person. The organizations are out. This is what I would probably tell somebody. <clears throat> I mean, sort of like, oh, just go out and do it anyway. Like like Will Larkins, who took that picture in of the of the walkout in Wicker Park, I think is also a student who, you know, has done all these things at, the, at their school and just, just doesn't seem to care. They just stand up for their rights. Um, but that's hard. So finding an organization that's bigger than just your group that can advise you. And like, I got pretty good advice about what our rights were to start the group what kind of behaviors to exhibit in meetings with the principal to sort of show that we knew our rights. I took a lot of notes. Um, they also advised like, you know, you don't want to go to a lawsuit right away, you know, like try to get the administration to um, go with you. They, they gave us advice. that's like, um, like try to, try to see what the administration really wants and try to speak their language and, meet somewhere where you can both be happy with the outcome. So we ended up, this is maybe off topic, but we wanted to start a gay, there was, nobody was using gender and sexuality lines back then, gay straight alliance. So the principal just, you know, against it, against it, against it. The meeting was two hours plus. And then he, he said, what about alliance of gay, lesbian, and straight students? And we said, so like he had to have a win. You know, he had to, he had to, he, he had to, like, we just put the word alliance first. Because first it was like the diversity club, and, you know, just call it the alliance. And we were like, no, no, no. But then like, he knew he wasn't going to get the full win. So I don't think he really even cared. He said, put the word alliance first. And we said, fine. So he was able to feel like we gave something and he felt like he gave a lot because he didn't really, I think at that point, he realized he didn't have a choice. I also, um, we got another contribution of Nietzsche who shared a link to some listen resources for students um, to get familiar with their rights, um, including information on how to file a complaint. Uh, thank you very much for sharing. Excellent. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I have another kind of big unanswerable question for you i guess uh, okay. do, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, uh, and i guess the question is um do we see an end in sight does, does all this legislation seem like a trend that you know maybe in a, in a couple of years might might start to slow or stop um or does this kind of seem in your experience and the data and the history you're familiar with does it seem as though this was perhaps a long time coming Wow. Well, I'm going to try to speak a little indirectly. And this is, this is, comes from no expertise on my part. This is just my observations that the level of meanness that has led to some of these laws, there is some evidence that it's too much for people. Um, if you all know what I'm saying. Um, I think there's some evidence that people uh, that even given all the parental rights arguments and all the stuff that, that I think um, people are, are, are maybe sort of feeling like 
it's enough. Enough is enough. And will there be some kind of backlash? Will politicians pay a price for this kind of um, behavior? This these kinds of um, this kind of meanness? Um, maybe, you know. I. I, I um, so I, I think a lot is going to. We're going to find out a lot in the next um, year, literally year. Like, like I think it's an election day, twenty twenty four. I didn't hear from Janae. Um, so, I think we're going to we're going to learn more. Um, but I'm I'm I won't say I'm hopeful, but I think there's a chance. Yeah, thank you for letting me pitch such a a, a difficult question to you. <laughs> uh, we are almost out of time. We've only got a handful of minutes left. So uh, participants, folks tuning in, this is your last chance to get any questions you may have in. Um, in the meantime, I do really quick, uh, once again, want to promote uh, the second part of this lecture that is coming up a week from today. Uh, same time, same place. Uh, this will be ideas from and for educators, where we're going to be exploring how educators, families, and communities can help LGBTQ plus youth thrive, even amid this wave of legislation that threatens their education, their well-being, and their very identities. Uh, Michael Sadowski will be back, and he will be joined by Carla Stevens and a wonderful panelist, a wonderful set of panelists, including Simone Chris, Clark Wolf Hemmel, and Elisa Waters. Um, I know I'm looking forward to it quite a bit, um, getting to hear some other folks' stories uh, in this landscape and how they are pushing back. Um, Michael, I don't know if you have any any other comments about this upcoming panel, a closing statement, a bit of wisdom you'd like to deliver to us. On the panel, don't miss it. it it's, you know... Uh, better than just me talking you know <laughs> it'll be terrific um these people are really doing amazing work out there and and you should hear from them um i think it will be both sobering and inspiring um i have a question actually um i know there were folks again who were interested in slides who were interested in um getting citations um this my my overall citations are at the end of the slideshow but what's the mechanism for sharing these things with folks Michael, you're not supposed to ask us questions. That's not how this works. <laughs> Sorry. Here, that's that is that's a fair point, though. I think what we might do is, um, if you share the information with me, I will ensure it gets out to the folks on the alt liberal arts mailing list, so that's everyone sweet. can have access to those resources um, once you know once the talk has ended. That's good. Uh, and I guess speaking of ending the talk, our questions have kind of dwindled. Um, we only have five minutes left anyway. We could just give folks their five minutes back. But if you if, if you have anything you'd like to wrap up the talk with, now would be your opportunity. No, I would just say, you know, for wherever you're sitting, just figure out how you can push back and make a difference. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that's an excellent place to to wrap up um we hope to see you all again next week um to continue this conversation and michael thank you so much for being here and for sharing your wisdom and for your eloquent answers thank you sophia you were a great moderator thank you <laughs> all right yeah have a good evening everybody a good rest of your monday <laughs>